Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Find a living in fisheries. The UAS Fisheries Technology Program offers online study from anywhere in Alaska, plus labs and workshops in many Alaska towns. most likely a chump. Find your living without leaving where you are. Fisheries Technology from UAS. The National Weather Service. Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us here at KKM Studios for Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. On uh, the breakup map for today, everything pretty well uh, broken up and with the ice gone, except uh, some lingering ice down at the end of the uh, Kobuk River there. Otherwise, a no attack, uh, wide open, porcupine wide open, and the North Slope rivers have yet to uh, start breaking up. And for the uh, satellite today, you can see clouds coming northwestward here into the southeast coast with a few showers around from uh, uh, Prince of Wales Island on up towards Sitka and uh, even over here over the eastern border, otherwise dry to the north. Another really nice day here over southern Alaska, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet into the Susitna Valley and up to the north, uh, definitely an increase in the clouds from what you've seen yesterday in the eastern interior, mostly north of the Alaska Range and then extending back down to the northern Cusco Valley. Pretty good out here in the west and sunshine there, Bristol Bay, down to the Alaska Peninsula to Nikolski. And this is just high clouds out here over the Perverloff Islands with uh, really not much change going on across the Bering Sea, as well as the Arctic coast over the last couple of days. Out farther west, just a lot of clouds, uh, basically high pressure at the surface out there resulting in pretty light winds. And rolling that into motion again, uh, upper level high up here over the Russian Far East and the clockwise flow around that, uh, that's, what's pulling, or <laughs> that's what's pulling the drier air out here over the Southeast Bering Sea and Bristol Bay and made for a pretty nice day there over the Alaska Peninsula. Then you get into all the clouds here in the West and again, uh, low pressure down in this area, a couple of bands of moisture uh, mostly uh, pulling back to the west-northwest, but uh, gradually shifting northward. So the southeast coast continues to slowly slip into a more or a wet weather pattern. And uh, today, just some scattered showers there with uh, mostly cloudy skies in the south, uh, improving up to the north there. And showers here over the interior with this uh, thermal trough. And actually, uh, thunderstorms reported uh, in the uh, northway area this afternoon. So there were some isolated or scattered thunderstorm activity there among the showers with uh, clouds on up to the north, uh, low clouds in areas, but the fog and flurries were quite isolated there, mainly along the eastern <clears throat> Arctic coast. And uh, kind of an offshore flow, uh, making pretty nice condition, conditions across the Seward Peninsula. Just um, isolated showers developing by mid-afternoon there over the southwest interior and uh, kind of a foggy drizzly pattern there over the southern Bering Sea down into the central Aleutians. And for tonight, uh, same pattern out there, north to maybe northeast wind flow continues at the surface. Big area, high pressure way out west toward Kamchatka Peninsula. So uh, no heavy winds and definitely no storminess uh, in the site there out over the Aleutians or the Bering Sea. And uh, again, possible isolated thunderstorms uh, this evening here in the southwest. Otherwise, uh, scattered showers along and north of that trough axis all the way up into the southern upper Yukon Valley. And 
areas of light snow and fog are possible uh, here from the north slopes of the central uh, Brooks Range area back on to the northeast across the Arctic coast. And uh, not a lot going on, uh, pretty tranquil here down across southern Alaska and Bristol Bay fair, partly the mostly cloudy skies, the Alaska Peninsula out to uh, the eastern Aleutians. And uh, mostly cloudy, scattered showers there for the southeast coast, a band to the south that'll be rolling up, uh, bringing some more shower activity in tomorrow. And then a trough up here with some clouds and scattered showers, mostly uh, along the Alaska Range and across the Tanana Valley on up to about Eagle. And the forecast for tomorrow, uh, a few more showers with cloudy skies here for the southeast coast. Otherwise, we've got this uh, sharpening ridge developing along the North Gulf Coast. So we're probably going to see some stronger winds or an increase in the winds there for the Copper River Basin, mainly along the Copper River, and also through Turnagain Arm, that kind of a pattern. Easterly flow here into Kodiak Island uh, possibly could result in some low clouds and fog, especially along the eastern coast there. Otherwise, uh, better chance of seeing some thunderstorms develop tomorrow afternoon from the western Alaska range back to the southwest. Uh, all the way to the mountains there, uh, the Kilburk Mountains, and uh, otherwise showers, and again, possible thunderstorms here over the eastern interior, uh, drying out back to the north and west, and then north of the Brooks Range, you pick up more clouds and a little bit of moisture, which uh, would fall in the form of flurries there on the eastern Arctic coast, again with areas of fog, but that offshore flow keeping it pretty good there along the coast, and a little to the west, definitely VFR tomorrow across the Seward Peninsula. And uh, mostly cloudy or variably cloudy from the Yukon Delta and go for mostly cloudy with northerly winds, maybe 10 to 20 miles an hour there out over the Bering Sea on down into the Aleutians and then diminishing out to the west. Next storm down here to the south, uh, rain with that approaching the southwest coast during the afternoon tomorrow. And tomorrow night that'll roll right in and produce rain, which will linger into the uh, afternoon or into the morning and then tend to become more showery in the afternoon. Quite a bit of moisture still flowing in around that low from south to north, uh, but generally becoming more showery toward the end of the day. Uh, mostly dry but cloudy here along the North Gulf Coast into Prince William Sound and uh, low pressure at the surface there right over northern Cook Inlet. That could uh, trigger some thunderstorm activity from the Talkeetnas and again from the western Alaska range back down to the southwest. Otherwise uh, pretty dry but mostly cloudy. Areas of fog possible there on the uh, Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula and uh, areas of the Bering Sea as well all the way up to St. Lawrence Island. Otherwise uh, kind of breezy in areas, especially higher elevations and through the passes of the Brooks Range with uh, Again, the isolated flurries and fog, and mostly cloudy to cloudy skies for the north slope in the Arctic coast, with uh, better conditions out to the west with a continued easterly flow. Otherwise, uh, not too bad here. Uh, probably looking at some marginal to IFR conditions on the Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula, and at times over toward the eastern Aleutians, and uh, definitely IFR there over the central Aleutians on up into the Bering Sea. And for temperatures today, all across the southeast coast, uh, lower 50s, definitely cooler to uh, mid 60s here over the northern panhandle with 52 at Sitka and uh, 71 Cordova this afternoon. Valdez had 66, 58 in Homer, lower 60s there across Kodiak Island and back into the 70s from Anchorage on up into the Susitna Valley, as well as the Copper River Basin up to the north, north of the mountains there, 50s, mid 50s, lower 60s for the Tanana Valley. Tanana pushed up to 61, 66 with the, a few more clouds there around McGrath. And then you drop into the 40s here over the Yukon Valley, back to the west of Bettles, uh, 30 degrees in Anatovic, but Arctic Village up to 43. And along the Arctic coast, temperatures near freezing, give or take a degree or two across the entire area up there with, uh, 40s there for the Nortak Valley, Kotzebue, and uh, 49 at Nome for the uh, southwest coast there, upper 40s to mid 50s, mid 30s for St. Lawrence Island, and some nice 70s 
uh, record high today at Bethel with 71. For uh, Cape Newenham, 59 and uh, 40s there across the Perbloffs, also 40s for the Aleutians, and then uh, pretty nice 60s here, lower 60s, warming up to 72 toward King Salmon. And lows for tonight, pretty mild here over the southwest in the lower to mid 50s. Uh, 40s, Tanana Valley, north of the mountains, or from the Brooks Range northward, look for mid to upper 20s, upper 30s in the northwest, 40s south central Alaska, and most of the southeast coast. Highs for tomorrow, uh, again, pushing up towards 70 degrees here in areas of Bristol Bay into the southwest. Also for the uh, uh, Susitna Valley, into the Copper River Basin, just 50s uh, from the Alaska Range northward. And for the southeast coast, uh, 50s. For flying weather tomorrow morning, we've got some IFR here right along the coastline, back in toward the Gulf of Alaska, but then southwestward there, uh, mostly east to Kodiak Island. So staying VFR here, North Gulf Coast, Cook Inlet, and some morning marginal VFR there over the Tanana Valley to the Alaska Range. And a lot of IFR possible there from mostly Wainwright on east toward Mackenzie Bay with uh, IFR also for St. Lawrence Island, increasing off to the southwest and some more down there toward the eastern Aleutians. But Anatovic, all the passes, VFR tomorrow, Lake Clark, Merrill, rainy, continuing VFR, windy VFR, Isabel VFR, same thing for Montasta and Tanita, Portage looking really good. Uh, becoming marginal here for the, south, or the Chilkoot White area in the afternoon. And for the freezing levels, uh, still looking at the chillier air here, uh, dropping into the northern Koyukuk and upper Yukon Valley areas, but uh, still staying on the high side here, but not quite as high as they've been as the high pressure area breaks down. Uh, six to maybe 8,000 feet, and then some cooler air spreading northeastward and across the panhandle from the Gulf of Alaska, and cooler yet out to the west. Icing threats, again, along that trough axis right through here, could be some areas of mixed icing, as well as the eastern Tanana Valley and the North Gulf Coast, and then some scattered areas here across the panhandle due to the shower activity, but a much bigger batch poised to move in tomorrow evening, overnight tomorrow night, associated with that next frontal system. And the winds aloft, uh, really not much flow at this elevation through uh, much of Alaska, we're looking at northeasterlies up to 70 knots over the central and western Arctic coast. Uh, something of a ridge popping up across the panhandle, but they'll still be mostly cloudy and showery ahead of this next system that will again roll in there tomorrow night. Otherwise, uh, kind of a trough over the Bering Sea and the Aleutians. 9,000 foot winds uh, south to southeast, uh, 20 to 25 knots up across the panhandle. Pretty light here for the North Gulf Coast and really light over the inland areas of southern Alaska. Only picking up to 10 knots from the east here up to the Brooks Range. Central Arctic Coast a little stronger as well as there just on the north side of the Seward Peninsula. Otherwise pretty light winds mostly out of the north here for the eastern Bering Sea as well as out to the west. And 9,000 feet, same pattern here. East northeast, uh, narrow band there, 25 to 40 knots up to the north. Light over southern Alaska, just 15 to 20 knots with the Bering Sea and the Aleutians, and 20 knots with the Panhandle. For turbulence, uh, right through here, possible areas of light mechanical turbulence, and here over uh, Canada, but uh, kind of a more extensive area there up along the Arctic coast and the North Slope into the Chukchi Sea. And after the break, I'll be back with a look at the marine forecasts. Coming up on Destination Tomorrow, we take a look at NASA's Aviation Safety Program. We'll look back at some highlights of the program and find out what the future holds for aviation. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. We found that changing the seats has made a lot of difference and saved a lot of lives. However, there's more we can do. When you look at the whole system, like changing the structure so that not only do we uh, has the seats stay attached, but energy is taken out of the system through the structure itself. And they're wearing special restraints that keep them in their seat 
and also may even put airbag technology in some of the aircraft. And for large airplanes, we're even looking at changing the design so that it will deliberately break in certain places. Then we can determine where not to put hot things or sharp things or fuel lines and things like that so that people can get out or egress through these openings in the large aircraft. Lisa, a lot of the things that you've described are things that NASA and the industry are doing to make flying safer, but is there anything the general public can do to make flying safer? Yes, you can check your luggage, all of it if possible, because things in the luggage bins do become flying objects in a crash event. Computers, for instance, are very heavy objects, and if they come flying through the aircraft at landing speeds of 200 knots, then you have an issue because it will definitely injure people. People are not replaceable, things are, so if you can check the luggage, then you're doing a great service to prevent injuries in an accident. We want people to walk away from these survivable events and not have any injuries. And we're working hard to get there. Did you know that NASA researchers are working with industry to better train pilots and airline personnel? In recent years, NASA researchers have developed textbooks and web-based programs that help increase pilot proficiency in an automated cockpit while also improving training for maintenance crews and inspectors. These programs are increasing awareness and helping to prevent future accidents from ever occurring. In recent years, NASA researchers have also been focused on reducing fuel flammability and in detecting fires aboard aircraft. In fact, NASA recently won the prestigious R&D 100 award for a fire detection system that has a very low false alarm rate. Dust, dirt, and aerosols frequently fool current fire detection systems, creating about 200 false alarms for every real fire. This is problematic for many different reasons. When a fire alarm goes off, a pilot will immediately initiate emergency landing procedures and will divert the flight to the closest airport. This is not only inconvenient, but is also very expensive, costing the airlines about $50,000 for each false alarm. It's clear to see that this new NASA system will not only save money, but also make flying safer. NASA has also worked to reduce the chance of an explosion inside an aircraft's fuel tank. When some fuel tanks are not completely full, research has found that wiring inside the tank may cause sparking. This sparking could ignite the oxygen contained in the empty space, causing an explosion. To fix this problem, researchers have designed a fuel system that can replace the oxygen in empty spaces with nitrogen. This works well because nitrogen suppresses fire while oxygen feeds it. Coming up, we'll take a look at a unique facility that is designed to test aircraft icing. But first, did you know that even if the engines on a large commercial aircraft fail, it should be able to glide safely to the ground? Most commercial jet aircraft have approximately a 15 to 1 glide ratio, which means it will glide 15 feet for each foot it descends. At this rate, an airplane flying at 35,000 feet can glide for about 525,000 feet, or 100 miles. Weather conditions play an important role in all flights. Perhaps one of the most dangerous conditions that can affect aircraft is ice. Fortunately, NASA researchers have been using a unique facility that can simulate the icing effects on aircraft. Thanks for the ice. You know, there's nothing like a beverage chilled with ice during a long flight. Inside an airplane, ice is something passengers desire. However, outside an airplane, ice can be dangerous especially if it forms on the wings or engines. I had the opportunity to speak with Judy Foss Van Zanti at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She's researching the effects of icing on aircraft at a unique facility called the Icing Research Tunnel. Researchers at this facility study the formation of ice on the exterior of aircraft. So while flying, the only ice you'll need to worry about is the ice inside your cup. Well, I'm standing right here in the Icing Research Tunnel. Right here we create on Earth, what it's like for an airplane to fly through an icing cloud up there. To do that, we got to make it windy, cold, and wet. Now, right now, I'm standing in front of the fan. We have the fan to create the wind, and in the test section, which is a much smaller cross-sectional area, we can get winds up to 400 miles per hour. So that's about as fast as a plane might fly through in an icing environment. We create the cold with our heat exchanger, 1,700 ton. It can cool 500 homes. That's how big it is. Uh, we can get from zero Celsius down to about minus 20, which is where the icing might occur in nature. And we have spray bars. The spray bars is what makes the icing tunnel. We create the rain. We create a mist. 
uh, that the airplane would fly through. Now the thing about the spray bars is the researchers need to control both how much water is in the cloud, the liquid water content we call it, and how big the drop size is. And we have spray bars specially designed to create those conditions. So in our test section, we create what it's like for a plane to fly through an icing cloud. So why did NASA build an icing research tunnel? As it turns out, during World War II, the Allies lost more aircraft to icing than enemy fires. They were trying to fly supplies over the Himalayas. So the Air Corps turned to NACA, that's NASA's predecessor, and asked them to build an icing research tunnel so we could understand what was going on and how to fix the problem. So what do you test in the icing research tunnel, or the IRT? What we test in the IRT is, is what makes sense to test. Now if you think about it, if you're in an airplane flying through an icing cloud, what surfaces are most critical to keep ice free? Well, it's the wings, which provide the lift, get you off the ground, and it's the engine inlet, which provides the forward thrust. So we typically can test just those components, just the wing or the engine inlet. So what happens when ice forms on an airplane's wing? Well, ice can disrupt the airflow over a wing and will eventually cause the airflow to separate. This separation of airflow creates more drag and less lift. If ice continues to form, the wing will no longer produce the appropriate amount of lift needed to keep the airplane in flight. In some cases, ice creates airflow separation over movable parts, like an aileron. This could create handling or control problems, and the plane could suddenly roll. As the wing is flying through the air, the ice only accumulates around the leading edge. So that's why ice protection systems only wrap around the first part, the front part of the wing. The biggest factor in how the ice grows is, uh, is temperature. So if it's really cold, the water droplet comes in, hits the front part of the wing, and freezes on impact. And you get this nice pointy rime shape. The more dangerous ice comes during warmer conditions, those closer to freezing, where the water comes in, hits the leading edge, and actually runs back a little bit. If that happens, the next droplet might come in, see that droplet that is frozen, and start to grow. So you might get these ram's horns that grow upstream. Now that significantly disrupts your airflow, and that is not, that's way off design, and that's very bad. Welcome back. Uh, south to southeasterlies here, 15, maybe 20 knots out along the coast. Same thing over the inside waters, but more southerly for Lynn Canal. And then for uh, Tuesday, it'll swing around to the north, but only 15 knots there for northern Lynn Canal. Uh, southeasterlies a little stronger, 20 knots, Stevens Passage with small craft advisories in the forecast for Clarence Strait. <clears throat> small craft advisories with south winds at 25 knots for the uh, uh, southern coast here, southeast 25 to the north becoming east at the extreme north. And for Prince William Sound, pretty light winds tomorrow and also for Cook Inlet, southeast 20 or east southeast 20 from the Barren Islands into Kamishak Bay, northeast at the same speed there for Shelikoff Strait with uh, easterlies 20 from Kodiak Island all the way up to the eastern or western North Gulf Coast. And then for Tuesday, light variable wind conditions with slight seas for Prince William Sound, uh, 10 to 15 knots southerlies for uh, Cook Inlet, light variable conditions in the forecast from uh, Kamishak Bay down across Shelikoff Strait, and then a little brisker here along Kodiak Island, the Barrens 20, 25 knots, Northeast 20 25 knots from the North Gulf Coast. And for tonight, or for tomorrow, for Bristol Bay, light west winds there. Uh, light winds also along the Alaska Peninsula, but northeast 15 to 20 knots from Castle Cape to Sitkanak. And for Tuesday, southwest 15, Bristol Bay, light west winds here in the Bering Sea, or actually just westerlies 15 there for the entire Alaska Peninsula, but northwest towards Kodiak Island. And for the eastern Aleutians, uh, northerly winds 15 knots, seas 5 to 7 feet, pick it up to 20 knots through the central Aleutians, all the way back into the far western zones. And then Tuesday, northwest 15 to 20 knots in the west, central areas north to northwest at 10 to 15. And that same wind pattern existing here all the way over to uh, the Fox Islands. And for the southwest coast, we've got northerlies at about 20 knots with 3 to 4 foot seas. Small craft advisories up around St. Lawrence Island, but a uh, pretty uniform wind pattern here across the entire Bering Sea, uh, roughly 20 knots. 
And then for Tuesday, uh, much lighter, northwest at 10 for the Perbolofs, but west 20 here blowing in toward Cusacom Bay. Uh, north end of Novak Island, uh, northwest 15, more northerly for St. Lawrence Island, and then back to the northwest toward St. Matthew. And for the eastern Arctic coast, uh, northeast at about 20 knots, turning east to northeast, 15 to 20 knots are the central and west side, 20 to 25 north northeasterlies from Whale to uh, Cape Beaufort. And then for Tuesday, still northeast through here, becoming easterly there from uh, Cape Thompson to Cape Beaufort, uh, small craft divisors on the western Arctic coast, but all easterly winds in the 20 to 25 knot range there for the central and eastern Arctic coast. For tonight, uh, this probably looks a little more significant than it actually will, will be, but uh, in that shaded area, look for uh, some areas of fog and possible flurries, and that'll extend right up the eastern Arctic coast. Uh, kind of breezy back here along the Brooks Range out to the northwest coast and uh, kind of diminishing into the northern interior. Uh, but mostly cloudy skies and showers here over the Tanana Valley up into the southern upper Yukon Valley with uh, continued fair conditions here. Lingering thunderstorms possible this evening in the southwest. And for the Pan Am, mostly cloudy skies with scattered showers, but here's the outer edge of that next storm, which will push quite close to the Prince Oils Island area during the afternoon. Otherwise, mostly cloudy, scattered showers, and a bare chance of thunderstorms from the Western Alaska Range all the way out toward Cuscoquam Bay. Uh, drier to the north, no change for the Arctic coast and North Slope. For uh, Tuesday, Monday night, that front rolls through with a lot of rain, which lingers through most of the day on Tuesday, eventually turning to showers, scattered thunderstorms over the... These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Alaska Pipeline Service Company, fueling philanthropic programs and dedicated to creating educational and professional opportunities for Alaska Native people.